All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. My name is Eric Gastron. I graduated from the business school a year ago, and I helped found the grad student effective altruism club at Harvard. And I'm Holly. I am a, a rising fourth year in organismic and evolutionary biology on the main campus, and I'm the incoming president of the grad student section of Harvard effective altruism. Eric's going to start too. <laughs> so people tell me um, I should start talks with a joke, but I'm not like a great stand-up comedian, so instead we just pulled up a funny YouTube video and we start with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally millions of lives have been changed all throughout the world through one-for-one -one programs, with shoes and with glasses. But here at Thames, we're on the lookout for what's next in the world of one-for-one. -for -one. And what we found is that in rural parts of Africa, there's this one need that most people don't even know about. And we have a solution, which is why we're excited to announce today the next chapter in our one-for-one -one line. Ready? Smoothie machines. <laughs> it's so simple. You buy one $600 smoothie machine, someone in Africa gets a $600 smoothie machine. Who doesn't have $600 lying around? Right off the bat, they may not understand how much they need this product, but, you know, given a little bit of time, they're, they're clearly going to oh, yeah. see how much use they get out of this every day. They'll uh, figure it out. We don't go into a community without knowing exactly what their needs are. Out of the hundreds of smoothie franchises available, we found that in rural Africa, there are exactly zero. Just they lit up when they saw this smoothie machine, you know? And I just felt like we brought them something so important that they'll cherish forever. <laughs> All right, so clearly not the best example of effective altruism. But I think there is a grain of truth in this video, which is that good intentions don't always equal good results. And in fact, with the actual Tom's company, one criticism that's been leveled at them is that distributing free shoes to kids doesn't have as big an impact as other things you could do with the same amount of resources, like public health interventions. So passion alone can be misleading, and if we really want to have the biggest impact, we have to combine our heart and our head. I think this is a chart that really demonstrates that on a macro scale. So the black bars show mortality from different diseases in the US, and the green bars show how much money is raised for different causes. Um, of course, as doctors, you guys could probably have expected that heart disease is one of the top killers of Americans. Um, and then also we know from fundraising, we know about the breast cancer, Avon walks, prostate cancer, November, ALS, uh, the ice bucket challenge. But what's striking about this is there's almost no correlation between the impact that a disease has and how much money is raised for it. And I think in an ideal world, we would be able to better prioritize which diseases we spend our resources fighting. So that brings us to the distinction between altruism, which is doing good for the world in any way possible, certainly fighting ALS or distributing free shoes to kids is altruistic and it does do good. But effective altruism is trying to do the most good that you possibly can given the limited resources, time, and energy that we have. Effective altruism is both a global movement and a philosophical framework, which I'll be explaining. The key principle is this idea of maximization, trying to do the most good, and there are a bunch of other kind of supporting principles which I'll walk through. So one is rationality, and how many of you guys are familiar with like Daniel Kahneman or his book, Thinking Fast and Slow? All right, good number. Um, I think being aware of the cognitive biases that um, people like Daniel Kahneman write about, which cause us to make decisions in um, kind of predictably bad ways, can help us better understand our decision making, make better decisions to, especially when it comes to altruism, when um, there's often more biases at play um, compared to our you know, professional or um, less emotional activities that we engage in. Um, and I'm sure that you guys cover evidence-based medicine in your curriculum. Carefully weighing evidence is a big part of altruism, 
of effective altruism. You could even think of it as like evidence-based altruism, what we're describing today. And resisting emotional manipulation. There are a lot of charities that show you pictures of cute kids or cute kittens to try to get you to support them, but just because they have the kind of most heart-wrenching images doesn't mean that they're necessarily the most effective organizations or causes to support. Another key principle is cosmopolitanism, and that's the idea that we should help people regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, or nationality. A lot of effective altruists expand that, uh, expand that to species, too, so they would include animals. And a lot of effective altruists would also include people who are living in the future, you know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, who we might be affecting now via climate change or nuclear proliferation or other causes. Then, of course, if you want to do the most good with limited resources, you have to think carefully about cost effectiveness. Now, in this example, consider um, we have a choice between two charities. One of them trains guide dogs for blind people in the U.S., and another one um, prevents river blindness in Africa. Now, it costs around um, $40,000 to train one guide dog for a blind person in the U.S., but um, using um, medications like ivermectin, you can prevent river blindness in one person for about $100. So with the same amount of money, we could help one person via the Guide Dog Foundation, or 400 uh, to 2,000 people um, by preventing river blindness. So while we would hope that every blind person can have the support and resources they need, um, the effective altruism approach is to say, first, let's try to do the things where we can have the greatest impact. Another key principle is scope sensitivity, which is paying attention to the size of a problem. A lot of the time, the number of zeros at the end of a big number, whether it's you know like a hundred, a thousand, a million, doesn't make any kind of emotional difference to us. But if we want to be strategic, we have to pay really close attention to that. Um, I think the example I showed before of diseases that you know cause most deaths aren't necessarily the ones raising the most money. That's kind of an example at a macro scale of lack of sensitivity to scope. And there's an interesting psychological experiment done where they interviewed people and they said um, there's been an oil spill, um, the town is thinking of creating nets that will save lots of birds from the oil. Um, how much money do you think um, each household should chip in to pay for these nets? And some people were told the nets would save 2,000 birds, some people were told the nets would save 200,000 birds. But the amount of money that people were willing to spend um, on saving the birds didn't really correlate at all to the number of birds saved. And it's because like, just the number of zeros doesn't have that much psychological impact on us. One really interesting thing is that the difference between a good cause and a great cause can often be 10x or 100x difference in terms of impact or cost effectiveness. So this is an example of one organization that does cause prioritization research. They're called the Copenhagen Consensus Center. They advise the UN. And they've done their own estimates of comparing um, very different causes to each other and estimating what kind of impact we could have on each one. And this is their listing from a year ago of what they thought the most impactful causes are. I'm sure all of us might have disagreements on you know, whether this is the correct ranking, but I think the thing to take away is that it's definitely true that in some areas we can have much greater impact than others, and finding those like highly, highly effective areas can be a really good use of our time. Wait, so trade liberalization, oh, yeah. how would you describe that? So their perspective is um, kind of like a free trade one, that by breaking down trade barriers, it'll cause economic growth in developing countries, um, and that economic growth would lead to improved lives for people in those countries. So that was their argument for trade liberalization. Um, you know, I'm not sure that I would even agree with that, um, but I think definitely there are some clear differences within like public health programs, like access to contraception, 
um, almost you know, certainly nine times better than increasing circumcision for those at risk from HIV. And that's something that there's like much harder data behind too. Another key principle is counterfactual reasoning. So thinking not just about direct impact, but also what would have happened otherwise or indirect impacts. So in this example, we compare this hospital on the left, we call it the BPE Institute, and they do 10,000 cataract surgeries per year, have a 98% success rate, and they're ranked number one. Um, the one on the right, AEC Hospital, only does half as many cataract surgeries per year, same success rate, um, it's not ranked, it's not a very well-known place. Now, if I were to ask, you know, which one has a greater impact, you might say, based on what I have here, clearly the one on the left, they're helping twice as many people as the one on the right. But, what if I told you that the one on the left is Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Florida, and the one on the right is Aravind Eye Care Hospital in Pondicherry, India. The reason that matters is because one in India is providing very low cost, um, subsidized cataract surgeries to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford them in an area where there aren't other types of hospitals performing these kinds of surgeries. So the counterfactual is, if this one didn't exist, probably people in Miami, Fort Lauderdale would still be able to get cataract surgeries elsewhere, they might have to wait longer. Um, but Aravind Eye Care Hospital, if it didn't exist, probably most of their patients wouldn't be able to get treatment elsewhere. So that concludes the kind of conceptual framework around effective altruism. Um, here are two examples of some of my favorite effective altruists. The first one, this guy on the left, is Norman Borlaug. He's the father of the Green Revolution which was a major agricultural advance in improving yields in um, India, Mexico, Pakistan. And it's estimated that his work saved, has saved two billion lives through increased agricultural production, which has prevented famines. And the people on the right are much smaller time effective altruists, but no less admirable. Um, Julie Wise and Jeff Kaufman, a social worker and a Google engineer, they earn combined around $200,000 a year and they donate half of their income to highly effective charities. They live in the Boston area, by the way. You can go to meetups with them. <laughs> They're also like really nice people. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the way that they decide which charities to give to in order to have the most impact is relying on this organization called GiveWell, which is a charity evaluator. They look at lots of different charities and compare the evidence behind what the charity is doing, um, estimate you know, what impact an additional dollar will have at that charity, and look at whether the charity is being transparent, accountable to donors, well-managed. So in addition to kind of the traditional looking at um, overhead ratios, you know, like how much money is spent on fundraising versus programs, that matters, but what matters a lot more is whether the programs that they're doing are ones that actually are highly cost effective, help a lot of people for um, lower amounts of money. And they've been doing very well. Um, they've partnered with one of the founders of Facebook, who's a billionaire. Um, in 2014, they moved around almost $30 million in money to their top recommended charities. And I think um, 2015 it was uh, over $60 million. So they're gaining a lot of influence. Another really important effective altruist organization is called 80,000 Hours. And they do career advice for people who want to figure out how to have greater social impact with their career. So they looked at how much impact the role has, how much it'll improve your career capital in terms of um, you know, building up your skill sets, your connections, um, your capabilities for the future. Um, they, of course, recommend that you consider the personal fit and they have information about you know, who might like which types of jobs, which ones have a work-life balance, things like that. Um, and then also how well-suited you are to each field. 
um, different jobs. And so, just out of curiosity, oh, yeah. who develops these sort of, like, who gets to determine, for example, role in fact, or career capital? Like, how do they project? Yeah, so the it's... The second half of the talk is going to be mostly about okay. 80,000 hours, so okay. I can um, fill you in more. But it's a small team, and they're, like, mostly have an economics background, and so they do, like, expected value calculations about it. And also it's based on, like, interviews with people in the field. And, um, you know, for yeah. things like fit and, like, what are issues that might come up. So it's, it's, a, it's like a risk analysis, expected value, social science. It's always, like, a little bit subjective, obviously. Mm -hmm. like, and, of yeah, course, it's... Yeah, it's based out of Oxford, and they hire researchers, and then all the research is like publicly available on the website, so you can see how they arrive at each conclusion too. Do you want to talk about animal journey? Uh, sure. Uh, switch <laughs> we can switch back. So, so um, now a give well exists for animal charities. So give well is just about human charities, but um, as we said, or as Eric said, uh, a lot of effective altruists extend their circle of concern to animals. I personally think animals are a really important cause. So they also rank in the same way that Gibble does. They look at, uh, you know, how many animals are helped and then like what kind of uh, suffering is alleviated for what money. And you can get, you can save so many animals for so little money, it's insane. Like I, the, their top charity saves like 11 animals per dollar that you donate just because they're so effective in like in reducing farmed, uh, farmed animal suffering. And uh, EA at Harvard is going strong. Uh, our presence is mostly on the main campus. Like, I'm not su surprised if none of you have ever heard of our group before because we've been trying to get into the medical school and this is our first uh, attempt. Um, but we have a speaker series, we have lots of social events, and we experiment a lot with what kind of social events we're gonna do. So, um, we're, and if you guys have any suggestion for like what you would wanna do, totally willing to hear it. We're planning for the next semester right now. And we do uh, various pledge drives, which I'll talk about more in the upcoming slides. And I just want to point out that already we have Stephen Pinker is speaking for us on September 6th. Um, so if you want to see Stephen Pinker, just take a note of that. And then uh, if you subscribe to our email list at the end of the talk, then you'll get updates about where it's going to be. And uh, just some past events that we did that might interest you. Uh, Gary Kasparov is not coming again, but we did have Gary Kasparov last year. Uh, he, to this Game of Thrones analogy talk, winter is coming, he called it. <laughs> and, um, and we do biosecurity as one of the cause areas that we're interested in. And we've had, uh, for instance, we had Dr. Mark Lipsich come and discuss uh, making pandemic pathogens in the lab and what should be done to contain them. So, Eric, can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. So, another program we run at the Effective Office group is called the Philanthropy Advisory Fellowship, where we recruit Harvard grad students from across the grad schools to work on interdisciplinary teams advising philanthropists and foundations on how they can have the most impact with their charitable dollars based on effective altruism principles. So this past year, we had some really awesome clients who worked with YouTube on creating a corporate philanthropy program called YouTube for Good, which hopefully will be announced soon. Um, we work with Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, which is a $100 million venture philanthropy organization that funds uh, nonprofit startups. And next semester, we're going to be working with the TripAdvisor Foundation on helping them craft their strategy for disaster relief. They do like $250,000 grants, they have an employee volunteering program. And we're also going to be working with the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Laura and John Arnold are a billionaire couple um, who signed the Giving Pledge to donate um, more than half of their income to charity. And they're interested in a few really interesting causes like um, research integrity in science. So how do we improve the replicability of scientific experiments? How do we improve you know, which scientific experiments get funded, published, those kinds of things. So if that's something you're interested, we encourage that you apply. The deadline will be in September. Um, it's a pretty simple application. You have to write a one-page charity pitch, um, researching a charity and explaining why you think it would be a good cause for a philanthropist. It doesn't have to be in any particular category. And um, we're also going to try to be funding the fellowships next semester so that fellows can earn a stipend. Um, but we're still raising money for that, so fingers crossed. Okay, 
also I want to mention about um, CAF, it's like, it's a, it could potentially be a really awesome resume item, and if you're looking to gain skills, which we're going to talk about, then that could be great. Oh yeah, as a side note, one of our fellows from last year got an internship at Draper Richards Kaplan, um, kind of as from working on this project, so it, it can be If you were business good. students, that would be like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Okay, so what can Harvard Medical students do? Um, uh, just right away, if you feel like I'm like not getting something about like your lives or something, or like I'm not understanding like uh, what your plans are, then just like speak up. Um, I'm not sure exactly what makes it. I just have a quick um, comment too. I think you guys are missing out on the whole graduate student population here as well. So there's a lot of PhD students here that. I only found out about this because I applied for the fellowship last year. It was on your email list, but I didn't get any emails about it through like my program office or anything like that. And there's like 60 people per year in my program that are on this campus as so well. Which program is that? Uh, Biological and Biomedical Sciences, BBS. Hmm. Yeah, it's like the PhD. So there are like multiple PhD programs yeah. here. Then we also have the School of Public Health, the dental students. Like it's a, yeah, it's a big. But in terms of just kind of jumping ahead when you guys said social events, like if you guys could potentially plan a Longwood event every once in a while that might be more health focused or science focused, I think that'll be really useful for everyone around here because then it's accessible. Like I know at least for other organizations, we can almost like it's very difficult to get Longwood students all the way out to Cambridge for events and, and vice versa. versa. Yeah. Because yeah, there's neuroscience program, immunology, virology, all the HSPH people. So, yeah, just a suggestion. I didn't realize I wasn't getting PBS. Yeah, I, like, and I, have, like, I have a list of all the administrators for this program because I run a different organization, so I can like give you that yeah, as we well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then of course, anybody who signs up for our email list, we can send that out. Um, then you will get the emails, but yeah, in yeah. terms of like reaching, you know, how fragmented all these lists are. Yeah, yeah, that. definitely. But we would really appreciate that. Um, yeah, because I think there's a lot of people that are would be interested in this if they heard about it. I exactly hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah also, um, I think there's a lot of students who aren't here today because we had like an exam this morning and people are just like, oh. <laughs> um, but if you, one thing you could do is just provide like a little paragraph of information, like a like a Google form sign up to join the listserv. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in getting information about events. Um, like I know I would have signed up for it even if it was just like add your name to a listserv. So like that way you can maybe get some people coming in for the new year because the new students are starting in August. Like, if I want to yes, if you guys have suggestions for like what times would be good, that's um, the other thing. Is like I don't really have a year to the ground uh, in the medical school, but I would really appreciate if somebody could do that for me and we could like make it the most accessible. So oh, that sounds great. Um, and you recommend a Google form? Uh, yeah. Oh, if you write that on your evaluation, that yeah, would be great. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I can put a star next to my name. Does anybody else want an evaluation form, by the way? <laughs> I'll just pass them around. Um, but yeah, you can leave such comments and helpful information. Thank you. Okay, so I've got some just very general suggestions, and yeah, I also would like to get to know you guys. So if you feel like this advice is useless or like way off, then please let me know. Um, so one way to have impact right now, uh, as a medical student, would be to join the Philanthropy Advisory Fellowship. I understand if you feel like that's a lot of time. I think it's, it's pretty valuable, but if we all uh, have limited time. There's lots of other stuff. Um, the sort of easy baseline for a lot of effective altruists is the giving what we can pledge, and that is pledging to donate 10% of your income annually and 1% while you're a student to effective charities. And I've taken the pledge, and yeah, Eric has also taken the pledge, and personally I um, just feel great about it, and I don't notice any like strain in my wallet or, you know, paying my bills. I just feel really good. Um, I know a lot of students like think they can afford it, especially if you have debt, your situation is different. Maybe you can't, but, but um, I think it's it's easier than people expect when they sign up, and you feel pretty good about it. So that's something you could do at any time right now, and that would be guaranteeing, uh, a, you know, if you go on to be in the medical profession, quite a large chunk of money to go to effective charities. Um, so there's a. So the next thing that might seem kind of obvious, so like what can HMS students do? Fighting global disease would be a big one. Pop quiz, what's the most effective way uh, to intercede against malaria? Awesome. <laughs> you guys got it. So I was wondering, 
not to be too cruel, but I was wondering if you'd say something like, um, I don't know, what's, what medication are we on now? Chlor chloroquine, does that still work? <laughs> or um, mefloquine? Or, um, I know it's hard to sign in, it's like the most right. Um, so yeah, but the answer is infect insecticide treated bed nets. And this is GiveWell's top recommended charity, is it gets malaria foundation, which just distributes insecticide treated bed nets. And it's like one net for every seven dollars you donate. So when I make my donations, I make, I do about half to against malaria foundation, and like in a year I've given out 98 nets, which is pretty nice. And each net protects someone from malaria exposure for four years. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, that's a lot of good you can do. And you know, it, it's um, in terms of saving a life, it's like you have to add up those years to their expected lifetime. But like in terms of reducing disease burden, in terms of you know allowing them to be more productive, and you know like be better parents and, you know, help build wealth in their communities instead of dealing with disease burden. It's really huge. What else can you do? Um, career choice. So this is where the bulk of my part of the presentation is going to be. And all of this research, essentially, is from 80,000 Hours, which is that organization in Oxford. It's, uh, it's kind of a think tank. It's um, a philosophy professor uh, started it. And then they have a lot of economists and um, and they have one person who uh, joined from doing a medical career in Australia. So um, it's a bit, so it's UK, Australia, a lot of their specific information about doctors. It might not be exactly um, your situation, but, um, but they have a lot of estimates and they come from a lot of different um, perspectives. And if you want to just assess the research yourself, it's on 80,000hours.org and you can check that out. Um, Oh, I also should mention that the 80,000 hours is for the number of hours that you supposedly work in your career. Which is a lot when you put it all together and think about it that way. So we want to start as like the baseline. Anybody in any career can make a difference by doing these things. So regardless of what the impact of your career is, you can donate some money, you can fundraise for good charities, advocate for effective causes, and uh, at any time, you can be building career capital, which is one of the things they emphasize, you know, gaining the ability to have a better job, a more influential, uh, more influential job, more, do more direct good, uh, in order to increase your impact. But I think you guys, I think you have the uh, <laughs> credentials right now, and you're like promising uh, to be <laughs> in, the <laughs> in one of the uh, most privileged positions in the world, and to have a really high paying job, and also to have a really explosive impact with your brains and your skills. So it's not no pressure. <laughs> it's, it's more to just inspire you. Like we actually are in just a really great position to have a big impact. So what's possible? Um, okay, so this is uh, taken from the 8,000 hours presentation and uh, just if you're a Fantastic doctor. I'm going to show you like a couple different estimates of like how many people a doctor saves. But if you're like, say, a surgeon who is the only person who can do this life-saving surgery, you might save 50 lives in your career, and like that's awesome. That's 50 people who are there because of you. Um, so like the probably the best you could do is about 100. That's the that's their estimate. Sorry, Paul, is that counterfactually adjusted? Uh, no. <laughs> it is not counterfactually adjusted, which is why you'll see a different number in a later slide. Um, but with medicine, you could have, so like, there's, there's your 50, and then here we have 50,000 with uh, doing research into something like oral rehydration. Yeah, 50 million. 50 million, yep. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, Dr. Nadal in the 1960s in Bangladesh helped invent oral rehydration therapy, which you probably know is just giving people salty water, but you know, to keep them from dying from diarrheal diseases. And it's estimated that, and this is even kind of an old estimate, so it might be larger now, but that about 50 million lives have been saved by this technology since it was invented. So to really put this in perspective, like imagine you need a million people doing this job to have the impact of one person doing something like inventing a new therapy to treat a common disease or a common symptom. And then that's not even the limit. So now like even oral rehydration therapy looks like crap next to this research, you know, uh, distinguishing baby of blood groups and making surgeries possible, more possible. 
So uh, Dr. Landsteiner in 1901, figuring out the science behind ABO blood groups made blood transfusions possible, and uh, many surgeries were possible because of that that were previously not. Um, and so uh, it, the estimate is that that saved about a billion people, and of course that's only going to keep growing, that number. Uh, whereas our practitioner here, you can hardly see, they, when they die, they stop saving lives. Um, okay, so the, I just repeated the slide. <laughs> So, our, no, it's not repeated actually. So, 80,000 hours uh, breaks down four different ways that you can have an impact with your career. You can directly do the good. Um, so, you could be hands on, somebody has to be there on the ground actually providing the treatment. Um, you can be an advocate for um, you know, raising people's attention, trying to redirect money, trying to raise attention to different research areas. Uh, you can do research, which is what they emphasize for biomedical stuff in that previous example, or you can uh, earn to give, which I can unpack uh, in the coming slides. And uh, people from 80,000 Hours are coming from Oxford to Boston in September, and there are definitely going to be two workshops on the 11th and the 17th on main campus, but um, we'll probably have more. Like, if they're just going to stay as long as there's demand. So. Um, Please do subscribe to get our emails about that to get and you will have to apply, but um but probably will have plenty of response. But um so those are really great. I did that and I like enjoy sitting in on them just because I just feel so empowered <laughs> by uh, their research and their uh, can do attitude about like you know taking this like amorphous like what do I do with my life, you know, and turning it into a real actionable problem. Okay, so being a doctor. I don't know. First, can I just get a show of hands, like how many people are thinking about being a doctor, like just being a practitioner? Okay, okay, so I'm not far off. <laughs> I thought maybe you were all going to be like biomedical research or something, so I didn't have to talk about this. But, um, okay, so pros of being a doctor, according to this research. Uh, they tend to have very high job and life satisfaction. Uh, it's high pain, and you can earn to give. You will have a direct impact, most likely. Um, and this is for, you know, allow for your personal fit. There's a reasonable variety among medical specialties. It's um, not the kind of, it's the kind of thing where you can find something that's a good fit for you. Most people tend to be satisfied with that. Or, you know, right, their interviews and, like, life satisfaction surveys. So, cons. Uh, the direct impact of being a doctor is modest, and it's smaller than conventional wisdom may suggest. Okay, so... What? <laughs> like, I mean, uh, considering that most people, you know, in surveys answer that they are becoming doctors for, they're drawn to medicine for humanitarian reasons, um, that's kind of surprising. But here is their reasoning. Uh, clinical practice is not scalable, so it's not like, you know, you invent oral rehydration therapy, that's there forever now, that's just salty water. You can tell people how to make the salty water in India, even if you're not there, you know, and then you die and it keeps on working. Um, that's scalable. Uh, clinical practice, of course, requires a lot of expertise. It requires, you know, say, uh, I guess it doesn't require face-to-face -face communication, but it's helped by that. Um, the way that it works is not scalable. And um, as you have just heard, uh, scale is, neglecting scale and scope is a huge cognitive bias that we have that gets in the way of maximizing good. Um, so there's the inverse care law uh, that healthcare resources and doctors tend to be concentrated in the areas that we need them. So, yeah, um, I'm sure this is not something you're unfamiliar with. Uh, it's widely accepted that the social determinants of health are more important to keeping people healthy than the work of the medical profession. And, uh, and then this is something that people often don't think of, replaceability. So if you hadn't gone to med school, someone nearly as good as you probably would have because it's so it's so popular to try and get into med school. I mean, I'm sure you know what you went 